Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Alana Valdez and I work at NYU Stern with the Master of Science in Business Analytics program. Our webinar on Introduction to Machine Learning for Business Executives with Dr. Roy Lowrance, Managing Director of the Center for Data Science at NYU's... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, my name is Alana Valdez and I work at NYU Stern with the MS in Business Analytics program. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on an introduction to machine learning for business executives with Dr. Roy Lowrance, Managing Director of the Center for Data Science at NYU's Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences. This webinar is brought to you by the MS in Business Analytics program, also known as MSBA. The MSBA program is a one-year Master of Science degree focusing on the intersection of business and data science to understand the role of data in solving current business challenges. The program is one year, part-time, and executive friendly with classes held in New York City and two rotating global locations. For more information, please visit our website and social media links following the presentation. I just have a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Everyone's computer should be muted, but if not, please do so now. And throughout the webinar, we will accept questions from the audience, which Dr. Lowrance will respond to upon completion of his presentation or throughout. You can type your questions in the chat section to the right of your screen, or you can email our colleague Meg Hallisey at M-H-A-L-L iss at stern at nyu.edu. For those of you on Twitter, we will be live tweeting the webinar on our MSBA account, which is at NYU Stern MSBA with the hashtag MSBA Machine Learning. This webinar will be recorded and available for those of you interested thereafter, and following the webinar, you will receive a brief survey. We greatly appreciate any feedback you can provide. Without further ado, we welcome Dr. Roy Lowrance today for his webinar on an introduction to machine learning for business executives. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks to the MSBA team for uh, making this opportunity to chat with you available. So uh, here's a little bit about me. I'm going to skip it and go right to the content. <clears throat> Can you make this go on? Sorry for the technical difficulties. We're just going to make sure this looks okay on our end. All right. Thank you. Great. Um, Hello, everyone, and thanks to the MSBA team for making this opportunity available. Uh, you can look me up on LinkedIn if you want to find out more. <clears throat> so uh, here's what I'm going to cover. I'm going to tell you about uh, what makes machine learning different from normal programming, and then I'm going to go into a bunch of terms that seem to overlap in meeting, uh, and I'll try to kind of put them in a taxonomy for you, data mining, machine learning, and AI. It's very important in a seminar like this to talk about the business impact of machine learning, so I'll have some material on that. And then I'll talk about some of the things that are uh, more or less leading edge, uh, namely reinforcement learning, uh, representation learning, and if we don't run out of time, uh, some material about artificial neural networks. Uh, please interrupt with questions via uh, the chat room or the email as we go. So, uh, let's get started. Uh, so machine learning uh, really works in uh, there's first a training phase and then a production phase. So this slide is about the training phase. You can see on the left you get some training data from some place. There's a training program that is run and it produces another program uh, which contains a fitted model. So the fitted model is usually uh, statistical 
And you'll notice the happy bubble at the top. Uh, the happy bubble is the person who understands the features. So this person is a, a domain expert and can tell you things like, if you want to estimate the price of houses, uh, you need to know how big the house is. So, so this is all dependent on getting uh, a feature expert involved. So after you do the uh, training phase, uh, or at least as you do it, you're going to be wondering, like, how good are the features? This is entirely dependent on either the knowledge that you acquire in the, pro in the project or uh, how good your feature expert is. So, uh, so that's a huge dependency on having good machine learning, at least as presented here. I'll come back to that in a moment. Once you, once you get the uh, program containing the fitted model working, you can run it in production. So you, you stick in your production data, you run your program against it, and you have some production results, which are often uh, predictions, or uh, and from them kind of recommendations on actions to take. Uh, if you put the whole thing together, you see a flow like this, where there is, first of all, a, a training phase and then the production phase. So Arthur uh, Samuel is one of the founders of machine learning. Uh, he wrote a lot of really good material that's very understandable, I think. Uh, so you might want to look him up. Uh, he said machine learning gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Uh, so, so what you have to write here is you have to run the training program. Uh, the interesting thing is that there are many off-the-shelf training programs or near off-the-shelf training programs like uh, the R system and Python has a bunch as well. So this is a clever shortcut if you just have that domain expert who knows what features are important. Uh, there's something just happening in the last uh, half decade called deep learning. What deep learning does is it dispenses with the feature expert. So with deep learning, uh, you also learn what features are important, and I'll explain how this works uh, later in the presentation. So let's contrast this with the traditional method. So this diagram looks pretty much like uh, the machine learning diagram, except I've changed the caption in the happy expert box uh, circle. And this time the happy expert knows both the features and exactly what the method is for doing things. So the example might be in payroll. So if you're a programmer and you're going to write a payroll system, there will typically be uh, many experts that tell you all of the tax rules for payroll. And then uh, payroll also interfaces to benefits, so all of the rules of the company about how the benefits package works. Typically, the programmer actually doesn't learn this material. Uh, they learn, the he or she learns how to kind of convert that knowledge into things that the computer understands. So that's the big difference uh, with machine learning. Uh, what you hope to do is, is reduce dependency on the expert and to um, uh, maybe uh, remove the dependency on the expert. So now let's talk about all these terms which almost mean the same thing. Uh, what I'll do is I'll go through and define them and then show you how to put them together, uh, at least uh, conceptually. So what is artificial intelligence? Uh, here I rely on the, on the definition from Russell and Norvig, who have written a, an excellent textbook that's not uh, mathematically intensive, uh, so it's a good textbook to look at. Uh, they say that artificial intelligence is the study of agents that uh, receive percepts from the environment, that means data from the environment, and then perform actions. And AI is attempting to build intelligent entities. So the example would be a robot for anything you want, uh, like for cleaning your floor, mopping your floor, uh, taking care of you when you're sick, uh, figuring out what groceries to order. Lots of things could be in the X there. This is all uh, part of artificial intelligence. So you can see this is like a super broad definition. So if it's this broad, everything else must be part of artificial intelligence. So let's look at machine learning. Uh, I'm using an, uh, the definition from a book written by Kevin Murphy. Uh, this is a textbook that's uh, mathematically intensive. Uh, so uh, you may want to look at that as well. So he says machine learning is development of methods that can automatically detect patterns in data and then use the uncovered patterns to predict future data and other outcomes of interest. So that's uh, kind of what I spoke about at the beginning where you have that uh, the training flow and then the production flow. 
The example uh, that I'll come back to as we go through here is predicting mortgage default. Uh, so mortgage defaults uh, sometimes happen randomly, but sometimes happen in patterns, like uh, maybe people don't have the income to pay for their mortgage. And then more recently, we saw uh, mortgage defaults because people strategically chose to default on the mortgage because that was better for them. Uh, so you could maybe do some pattern discovery and then predict future mortgage defaults. So that's machine learning. And the final uh, topic uh, or buzzword is data mining. So uh, there's a good data mining book by uh, Witt, uh, Witten and, and Frank. Uh, it's not mathematically intensive. Uh, he, uh, they say it's the process of discovering patterns in data. Uh, so this would include, uh, in my view, both machine learning and just understanding the data by drawing usually visuals that help you understand the data uh, better. A good example of something going on at NYU is that we have an initiative to learn something about taxi usage in New York City. So the team working on that project has figured out it's the same pattern of taxi usage every year except if something unusual happens like uh, there's a hurricane or the president comes to town. So that's just uh, knowledge that nobody had before. So how would you nest these? Uh, the way I would nest them is say artificial intelligence is the biggest topic and data mining goes within that. Uh, there are lots of other things in artificial intelligence other than data mining and that's why I've left some of that blue space. Data mining includes I think at least machine learning and at least visualization and probably other things as well. So that's my take on the nesting and I don't think it's definitive. So what happens is people use these terms more or less interchangeably. Uh, the other term you'll hear is uh, statistics. And that's the one that's like super controversial because uh, in academic institutions there are statistics departments and sometimes there are machine learning departments and then they try to figure out which subject nests in the other subject. Uh, so there's no need to go into that. Uh, so now I'm back to the outline. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the business impact of machine learning. So first of all, machine learning is new, and it is uh, uh, it's a subject that many people in corporations and government don't understand. So why is there this enthusiasm to get to know something about machine learning? I think there are four primary reasons. Uh, one of them is that sometimes the outputs uh, or what you want the computer to do, that's the output, or just too hard to specify fully. Uh, sometimes the expert is too hard to find, or sometimes the best solutions change too rapidly, and you don't have the luxury of continuously engaging uh, many, many different experts. So look, let's look at some examples that are kind of hard to specify, uh, because it's really hard to nail down the expertise. Like driving a car, uh, everybody on this a webinar probably knows that this is something that's going to happen. Uh, so robots will drive cars, but exactly specifying how to drive a car is really hard. Uh, so, so that's an example where you want to learn how to drive a car instead of specify how to drive a car. Identifying faces in pictures, uh, almost every camera you have now has a mach machine learning in it to pick out the faces so that it can focus on the faces. Uh, and maybe adjust the uh, f-stops and ISO for those faces. So, uh, so that's really hard to specify as an algorithm as well. Like, what is a face? How would you really know? Uh, naming objects in pictures, so attaching the name to the objects is really hard. There are a lot of objects. Uh, more of a business example is predicting customer churn. Customers churn for many different reasons. Uh, some of these reasons may be kind of always present, but some of them may have been caused by something that uh, just happened, like uh, something that just happened with a competitor's announcement. So how do you fully specify th these things? It's like impossible. Uh, a project that's going on at NYU uh, in the Center for Data Science is identifying people uh, that will be diagnosed uh, with type 2 diabetes in the next year. Uh, so this is being identified off of the medical claims data. And it's people who are not yet diagnosed. So this is a, a breakthrough in diagnosis and needs a lot of statistical techniques uh, underneath it. And it's something that's kind of hard to fully specify. 
So that's the first uh, reason to use machine learning. Just the outputs can't be fully specified. You don't have the expertise. Uh, the second reason is uh, just that many of those learning algorithms can be off the shelf. Uh, and you can just reuse them. So, uh, and then you have to do a minimal amount of programming. So an example is logistic regression. Uh, there are off, uh, many off-the-shelf implementations uh, of logistic regression. And you can use this uh, often uh, whenever you need to predict the probability of something. So it's, you get a lot of reuse. Uh, third reason is that machines learn faster than people in some domains. So for example, if you want to predict uh, traffic congestion, uh, it may help to know the very recent history of the highways you're trying to predict the congestion on, and therefore you don't have time to get a person involved. So it's just too fast. And then finally, there are some uh, data sets that are just too big for humans uh, to learn on. So you could assemble a data set uh, explaining which advertisements have worked better on which web pages, but then you get a human to uh, scroll through billions of examples is going to be just too hard. So sometimes you're just overwhelmed with the data. So those are the kind of the four reasons. Now it is not true that machine learning in and of itself, if inserted into a business, will help the business. A machine learning needs to be part of a, a large set of changes that get made concurrently. Uh, so uh, I would typically work in this flow. So usually you start with figuring out what decisions would have the most value from automation. Uh, so these could be all types of decisions that are made in corporations. These are going to be decisions that are made repe uh, repeatedly uh, because otherwise they can't be automated. So, so these are typically not strategy decisions but often operating. So for discount. Uh, what article do you show on your website, given that somebody has looked at other articles that you've published? Uh, what ad do you run? All types of decisions. Um, and, you, and you need to look at them and think about the business strategy, uh, which ones have the best uh, both long-term and short-term payoffs, uh, which ones will cause the market to evolve in a way that advantages your business. Uh, so there's a bunch of work to be done before you get to the machine learning at all. Uh, usually, once you find these decisions, you have to go to the second step, which is to augment the data ecosystem. So this happens because now uh, the technologies for storing a lot of data uh, cost-effectively, uh, such as Hadoop, are just coming online. And a lot of data is stored in more expensive technologies and have been either thrown away or, or, or archived. So this data needs to be made accessible. Uh, and uh, sometimes you need to convert from uh, things like relational databases to things like uh, Hadoop uh, to uh, be able to access the data cost effectively and quickly. So that's the second step. You need to kind of rebuild uh, or build out the data ecosystem. Then finally you get to the machine learning portion. So you need to automate the selected uh, decisions. Uh, for that, uh, You'll usually draw on experts, and they're in a precarious position. So they're about to supply you with expertise to let you automate away their jobs. And so you need to think very carefully about how you manage that. Uh, you also need to think that uh, sometimes you won't be able to automate all of the decisions. Uh, this is typical. So you might be able to automate, say, 80% of the decisions. So 20% of the decisions will be not uh, automated. So 20% of the experts are going to remain. So how do you think that through? Uh, usually when you automate something, you need new tool sets, both to uh, learn the automation to, and to deploy the automation, but then also kind of to manage the systems uh, once they're in production. So how do you look at the data exhaust of a production machine learning system to figure out that it continues to do something reasonable? Uh, fourth is uh, to now, uh, just before you deploy it, uh, uh, maybe way before you deploy it, is redesign the business processes and career paths. So uh, as I've spoken about, the automated decision paths need new skills, and where things are not automated on those decision paths, you're going to have retention issues and uh, actually replenishment issues. So how do you replenish the people 
with the right skills. Then you need to monitor whatever it is you've revised. Uh, you need to monitor both the, uh, the business processes and the career paths. Uh, you also need to look at the strategic setting that your company exists in. Uh, there's a good article written by R. A. Liberikian uh, that you can find on the web on this exact topic. So now we're back to uh, some new buzzwords uh, that are kind of contemporary. And what I'm going to do is kind of work our way through these. So uh, let's start with reinforcement learning. Uh, reinforcement learning is uh, very important when you're trying to figure out uh, the right thing to do and the environment is very dynamic. So let me give you the definition. So it's a learning system that adapts to behavior adapts uh, its behavior in order to maximize a special signal from the environment. So what this is, it's a robot. So the robot is figuring out what, how to behave in order to get data. So it's basically running experiments that produce data that is useful. So let's compare it uh, to regular machine learning. So regular machine learning did not have a step where you decided what information to get. Uh, regular machine learning doesn't have uh, a direct reward for acquiring information. So what happens in uh, regular machine learning is you just feed in the training data and you kind of learn the model. So that's different. Uh, reinforcement learning also includes a time element that's not present in, in uh, normal machine learning. So usually what you want to do in reinforcement learning is maximize a cumulative uh, discounted uh, reward, uh, which uh, so, so that's the, the net present value. And then uh, you want to decide at every step whether to explore or exploit. And this is important. So explore means uh, you decide to get some information on something where you don't know a lot. So you, you run a new experiment uh, that's supposed to produce something useful. Exploit means you decide to use the information you have now and make the best possible decision based on the information you have. So let's explore a little bit more on this and go through an example. Uh, so let's say you're trying to monetize website visitors. You might want to sell some stuff directly to them. You might want them to click on some ads. Uh, you might want to encourage them to stay on your website so you could maybe sell more stuff to them or get them to click on more ads. And let's look at traditional A-B testing. Uh, so this is uh, the way that uh, you would do it before reinforcement learning was available. So what you would do is you would split, uh, you would design a training experiment and you would split it into two randomized variants, uh, say choice A and choice B. And then you'd run the experiment using the decided split. So you might decide 50% get treatment A, 50% get treatment B. Uh, this should all sound familiar because it's traditional statistics. And then you would gather some data and you would measure the click-through rates or the sell-through rates or an indication of engagement with the website, like time on page. Uh, and then you would compare the means that you uh, found through uh, the experiments uh, using some statistical technique. Maybe you'd use a t-test. And subsequently, what you would do is you would say, well, it's always better, or B was better on average, so we're always going to do B. So, so that's the traditional way of doing it. Uh, there's lots of material on the web on how to do this. Just look up A-B testing, and you'll see many, many websites. But let's look at reinforcement learning. There's a lot less on the web about this because it's newer. Uh, reinforcement learning in the academic community is called the multi-arm bandit. Uh, and I'll come back to why that makes sense in a moment. But first of all, uh, so the way it works is you, again, have two choices, A and B, and you run one of them first. So let's say first you run choice A. And then running choice A will give you a reward. Uh, and the reward might be a click or a not click. So the reward might be one or zero. And then you have to make a decision. So now you're back to uh, exploit and explore. So now you're going to decide uh, the next choice based on your cumulative uh, rewards so far. So uh, one procedure, there are lots of ways for doing this. Uh, one procedure that is easy to understand and popular and pretty good is called epsilon greedy. 
And what you do is you exploit what you know 90% of the time, say, and then you explore something you don't know by making a random move. So you randomly choose between A and B, say, 10% uh, of the time. So what that would let you do is it would let you uh, gradually learn what your best choice is. So, so that's one of the, the, the key differences you learn as you go. That might be an advantage and might be a disadvantage because in the uh, standard A-B testing, you learn before you deployed. Here you're deploying and actually changing your website, in our example, as you were learning. And you may get comfortable with that or may not get comfortable with that. Uh, another key difference, I think it might be more telling, is you can also forget as you go. So the way you forget as you go is you go back to the explore step just above and you randomly pick from uh, the, uh, uh, you randomly pick uh, the best choice, this is in the exploit step, looking at say the last uh, 100,000 decisions you had to make, make. And so what will happen is if somehow the population you're dealing with uh, changes their behavior, you'll gradually pick this up. Uh, that's really hard to gradually pick up when you do standard A-B testing. Uh, in fact, you have to rerun the experiments. So this lets you run the experiment as you go. And uh, another difference here is you only see the rewards for choices made. Uh, and so that may be a disadvantage because with A-B testing, you can kind of balance the design so that you see enough of both the A and B rewards to draw whatever conclusion you want to draw. So a uh, multi-arm bandit, uh, so it's called that because uh, the metaphor that's used by the mathematicians who work on this thing is that you're in a casino and you're dealing with uh, slot machines, which are one arm um, or, or one of them, and the bandit has multiple arms and you have to figure out which arm to pull. So that's what's called multi-arm bandit. That's the search term you want to use uh, if you're looking for this. There's a very new, uh, much improved version of the multi-arm bandit, which is called the contextual bandit. So you will notice uh, back in this description that when you make your choice uh, in the exploit stage, you're not using any of the data you have. You're kind of making a blind choice. Uh, that cannot be the best thing to do. So what the contextual bandit says is make a choice based on what you've learned so far. So the algorithm is slightly different. So what you do first is you're running your website and you observe a whole bunch of features. So uh, you've probably uh, cookied the user, so you know a bunch of user features. You know a bunch of features about your website. Uh, you know the time of the day for the user. Uh, you know uh, whether any uh, presidential candidate made a particularly outrageous statement today, all types of things that might be useful in predicting behavior. Then you decide on a choice, and that, that's function f, which would depend on the context vector, all of the features you see, and then everything you've seen before. Uh, maybe forgetting some things if, the, if you have a sliding window approach, but all your previous context vectors, all the choices you have made previously, and all the rewards you have seen. So you make your choice, so the choice might be A or B, and then you observe a reward Y. So it's a little bit different, it's uh, more sophisticated, and then you need to decide uh, your next choice based on the cumulative results so far. So one procedure that's pretty good is called epoch greedy, and it's easy to understand. So what you do here is in the first step you just pick something randomly, and then in some number of other steps, say nine in the example, just to keep it easy, you use the best choice according to the function f. And so this is easy, except you need to design function f. And designing function f is actually hard, and that needs a machine learning person to do. So I'm going to push on to representation learning. So, uh, so I said when we uh, did the uh, machine learning chart at first, where you had the happy uh, user uh, who was the expert on the features, uh, the reason he's happy is that he's fully engaged in your process. And he or she uh, gets to basically control your process. Uh, he or she is the expert on what makes a difference. And uh, they're usually pretty happy to do that because it 
it's a great position to be in. But just think about it. Suppose the expert wasn't very expert. How would you figure that out? Because as a machine learner, you may not know this. Uh, so, so that's a problem. So what we want to do now is uh, try to get the expert out of the loop. Uh, suppose, uh, for example, that uh, you were trying to predict housing prices and I was your expert and you interviewed me. And at, during the interview, I said nothing about the neighborhood. Then you would think, well, you know, Roy's probably not a good expert on housing prices. Maybe he knows something else. So, um, so your this dependency you could pick up because you have a really good intuitive understanding of housing prices. But if I was trying to predict something kind of much more complicated, like um, uh, engagement on a website, you might not have good intuition. So, uh, so what we want to do is design uh, pipelines and learning stages that don't have the expert. And so what we're going to do is we're learning to figure out what the features are. So, so uh, and maybe not figure out all the features, but maybe just figure out the features we're going to use, which is called the representation. So we're going to use machine learning to build representations that make classifiers and regressors more accurate. Uh, there is a really good paper by Bengio and a big team that you can look up uh, that ex uh, gives you the technical details. So uh, probably in your coursework in the MSBA, you already know some, some manual techniques to do something that's very close to representation learning. So you probably know about k-means clustering. Uh, the way that works is you pick k, like k might be 4. Uh, you find some similar groupings of the things you're observing. And then you create a brand new feature, which is the group number. Uh, so, the, so the canonical example is customer segmentation. You know, there are four groups of customers, each of which behave consistently but somehow differently from the others. And knowing which uh, segment a customer in is valuable for figuring out what to offer, how to price, uh, what they're likely to click on, and so forth. Uh, you may have read about principal components analysis and may have even worked with it. There are a lot of kind of CAN routines and R and other packages that will produce the principal components. So the idea in principal components analysis is you have too many features. Uh, so uh, you might have too many features, you think, because the training time for your model is very long. So it could be uh, weeks or months. I once trained a model that took 270 uh, days to train, so that's very long training time. Uh, you might think you have too many features because gathering all those features might be really difficult. You just wish you had fewer features. So what you do in, with uh, principal component analysis is you uh, identify features that are highly correlated, that almost have the same information content. That's what highly correlated means. And then you remove them. And you, then you aggregate up some new features. And these new features are called the principal components for historical reasons. So for an example, uh, going back to predicting housing prices, you may have a feature vector that has all house features, all the neighborhood features, every feature of the time period, just a huge number of features. Uh, in uh, real estate price prediction, those might reduce to something that indicates the wealth of the neighborhood, which might depend on only two or three data points, and then the size of the house which might depend on just a handful of data points. So, so that's why you might want to do principal components analysis. And then you would be the, by hand doing uh, feature engineering. But there is an automated way. And it's called deep learning. So that's a good buzzword. And you'll find lots on the web about deep learning. So the idea is to learn new features that are derived from existing features that somehow make the classification or regression task easier. And understanding how this works uh, requires a good deal of math. So I'll just quickly go over some of the buzzwords and see if I can explain it uh, without a lot of math. So the tools in doing this are typically things called restricted Boltzmann machines. These are somehow Boltzmann machines, whatever they are, that have constraints on them. They're a little bit easier to work with for some reason. But what they do is they detect features in the inputs that maximally explain variations in the inputs. This sounds a lot like principal components analysis, and it is. It's very closely related. 
Uh, then there are things called autoencoders, which attempt to find a shorter feature vector that contains most of the information in the longer input feature vector. That also sounds very much like principal components analysis. And both of these things would essentially be principal components analysis, except that they inject some noise into the features, uh, into the representation. And the noise helps uh, avoid overfitting, and it helps the resulting feature set to be generalizable in the uh, classification or regression model. So it's, uh, it's wonderful that re uh, actually uh, injecting noise makes the problem easier to solve. So uh, here's the canonical example. So you have a picture and you know you can see all the pixels in it and you could see the red, green, blue encoding of all the pixels and know the intensity levels. Working with the pictures at that representation is extremely difficult. But what you'd like to have out of that is really where are the edges of the objects in the picture and then are there distinct regions in the picture like, picture, like is that region right there the face of somebody. And so it turns out that you can use deep learning tools to automatically uh, build uh, learning algorithms that find those features. And then you can write whatever your classification problem or regression problem is on top of that feature set. So that's called deep learning. Uh, so I think there's a question. Is there a question? So I get to read the question. Hold on. Please comment on where and when you see deep learning gaining traction and solving mainstream business problems besides M and Envision. Yes, yeah, so, so that's the question I keep asking as well. So, so I go to the uh, uh, deep learning folks at NYU and I say, is this usable for regular problems? And they say, they all say that it is. Uh, but nobody uh, that I have found is doing research in this area. And the reason is understanding the tools is very uh, difficult. It's, uh, it's a complicated mathematical endeavor uh, right now, uh, but uh, probably uh, the, this will work for uh, regular business problems and government problems, by the way, as well. It's just a matter of getting around to doing the research. Uh, the agenda of the researchers is driven by uh, ability to get things published, and it turns out there are a lot of papers published on identifying uh, things in uh, photographs. And so if you want to write a paper with a better technique, you have a really good uh, history of papers that you can then beat. Uh, so I, I think this will be coming in the next several years. It's kind of waiting to get started. But I'm pretty sure this will happen. So I'm going to push on. So thank you for that question. Uh, please ask questions as we go. Uh, so now I want to talk about artificial uh, neural networks and because we do have time for it. So uh, here's the idea. Uh, let's draw inspiration uh, from the overall design of the brains of mammals. And now here we're going to kind of pause for a one semester course in how uh, the brains of mammals work, except we actually don't have a semester. So what I'm going to do is just refer you to a photograph and uh, tell you things that you probably know, that there are these neurons, which are the computing engine, and there are these dendrites and axons, which are the, the inputs and outputs. Uh, and uh, somehow this works by a combination of chemistry and electricity. And uh, the brains are usually highly redundant, so that if you get an impairment, say, in the part of your brain which processes uh, vision, uh, the rest of your brain will retrain itself often so that you can overcome this impairment. Uh, you see this with stroke uh, victims, that they uh, sometimes relearn functions that they have lost by retraining uh, different parts of their brain. So I'm not going to explain biology, uh, but I'm going to explain artificial neural networks. So we take this uh, complicated picture of how things really are, and we convert it to this mathematical abstraction. So on the left are some inputs. I'm just I'm going to give a really simple example. Uh, so two inputs, and you want to convert it to one output. So the two inputs might be uh, the wealth of the neighborhood and the size of the house, and the output might be the price of the house. So there are a whole bunch of hidden features 
the hidden features are there uh, for a mathematical reason. Uh, because they are there, this neural network, the simple one that I'm showing you here, can learn any function as accurately as you please if you just provide enough hidden networks, uh, uh, enough hidden nodes, and enough training data. Uh, so that theorem doesn't help you a lot, but it does give you uh, hope that maybe you can get neural networks to do actually most anything. So the neural networks are tricky to train. Uh, so uh, the way they work is that the inputs are kind of propagated through the bubbles. So looking at the blue bubbles on the left, those are just, they just have outputs. But all of the other bubbles, are, or the ones in the middle, have both an input and an output. So what the inputs do is they wait, uh, what they do is they wait and sum the inputs. So this is just like a weighted sum. And then they take that weighted sum, which is a number, and they pass it through a function which is cleverly chosen. Uh, which is called the activation function. And there are uh, a bunch of good choices for the activation function. You'd have to read the literature. Uh, the reason these are good is uh, mathematical, and I'm not going to try to explain it. Then there's a training procedure. So what the training procedure does is it figures out all of these weights because the computation is fully specified by the weights. And so all you have to do in training is to run is to pick some weights, so pick them randomly, run one example, to a training example, through uh, the process. So in, in the example I'm using, you run one house price through knowing the wealth of the neighborhood and the size of the house. You predict it's worth $100,000, but your data says it actually sold for $120,000. Then what you do is you adjust the weights so that if it sees that exact training sample again, it'll be slightly more accurate. Uh, so there's some art in getting this to work, uh, but there are a lot of uh, good papers now uh, written on how to do it, and some information in textbooks that are published in the last few years on how to do this. So that's how you learn the weights. And if you get the, um, the weights done uh, correctly, you can represent any transformation, like I said. Uh, and then you can actually use uh, the hidden layers uh, to stack. So going back to this one, I show one set of hidden layers, uh, but there's no reason you couldn't have two or three or 20 uh, sets of hidden layers. And the more hidden layers you have, um, if you're using deep learning, you can arrange to train using these uh, uh, autoencoders or restricted Boltzmann machine, each layer to be an abstraction of the previous layer. So for example, Suppose there are two layers, and the input is not housing data, but uh, pixels from an image. So in the first layer, you might learn where the edges are. And in the second layer, you might learn the regions, where are the regions, the connected areas. And then you might build up several layers to learn even more abstract things. And then finally, you would put your uh, classifier or predictor on the final layer. So that's how these things get uh, built up. Uh, the technology for doing this became uh, a rapidly, kind of, it entered into a pretty rapid development about five years ago. Uh, so, so that's what deep learning is. Uh, it invariably uses artificial neural networks. So now we're at the question uh, portion. Happy to get questions on anything. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. We have a couple of questions from the audience that we just wanted to review with you. Okay, uh, where, what industry do you see machine learning having the biggest impact? Um, so, for, for, first of all, uh, it will be most industries. Um, and the reason is most indus industries have either uh, many repetitive decisions that can be made either better or worse or an ability to put um, um, uh, basically broadcast broadcasters on every object that the value chain depends on and therefore participate in the Internet of Things, uh, which is a huge big data challenge. Uh, once you have a lot of data, you're probably going to want to understand it. So, and that means doing some classification on it, 
Like are things going as we plan or has something gone wrong? So I, I think it's actually most businesses and I think also uh, much government, uh, medicine will be a big area as well. The three that I see uh, going first, if you will, are, are these three. So I see a lot happening in financial services. Uh, a part of this is because a lot of high-risk decisions are made in financial services. There's a history of having kind of physics-based prediction from the Wall Street quants uh, that's in place. And now people are starting to think about uh, machine learning-based predictions as well. Uh, but in financial services, uh, there are a huge number of applications like credit decisions, trading decisions. Uh, one that happens to be huge right now is anti-money laundering uh, compliance where the uh, big banks uh, spend, uh, some of them, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in operating costs just trying to determine whether an alarm that's gone off is a false positive, that means a, an alarm that you can ignore, or a true positive, meaning that if you don't report it, the government punishes you by fining you. Uh, so financial services are probably the biggest opportunity right now. I think right behind them is healthcare, uh, which, uh, so there are a lot of businesses in healthcare and there are government agencies in healthcare as well. There's a lot that can be done in predicting uh, what behaviors cause which diseases and encouraging people to adopt new behaviors. Uh, earlier I spoke about the work on type 2 diabetes being done at NYU, but uh, part of that work is to predict uh, tens of other diseases that can be predicted in a similar way. Uh, and these can be used by insurance companies to try to uh, both uh, cut the cost of insurance and to induce uh, better behavior in people, or at least more healthy behavior. Uh, the third one I see going on is uh, retail, including websites. So a lot is happening in retailers. Uh, the retail supply chain is, uh, is a supply chain that needs the Internet of Things. Uh, Walmart is the great example of controlling its supply chain and kind of optimizing around its supply chain. Uh, but uh, they're not necessarily the great example of machine learning and retailing. So there's a retailer uh, in the southeast called uh, Harris Teeter that has uh, a lot of predictions on customer behavior. So they prepare, for example, uh, customized emails with uh, specific offers. Uh, this group probably um, knows of some ways you can go kind of badly wrong uh, with that. Uh, but they also have prepared like a shopping list application that people put on their uh, telephones and it lets them kind of pick out the items they're most likely to need and then actually push a button and have a uh, Harris Teeter pack, it, uh, pack them up for them. So all they have to do is pull up and pick them up. So I think retailing is another big one, uh, but I think it's going to be most industries. Uh, the support for this comes in part from uh, General Electric, you can do this search. So this search for uh, GE chairman. Uh, so, so GE is, is mostly a manufacturing company because they've uh, downsized their financial services uh, participation in the last five years. GE's chairman claims that they've hired thousands of data scientists and they intend to hire thousands more. So they must see value in uh, the data scientists. And most of the data scientists work on machine learning, uh, some on visualization. So there must be opportunities everywhere. So let me go to the next question. The next question is, I'm reading it to make sure I can read it. Are multivariable deep learn, real deep learning algorithms self-optimizing? And the answer is yes and no. So all of these techniques where there's an optimization to be done, uh, um, they're in two categories. Uh, simple and complex. The simple ones, you're sure that when you're, when you can make no progress, uh, that you're at an optimal point, you're at the best point. Uh, these are settings that mostly are kind of well known and most problems are not simple. <laughs> so most problems are complex. So what happens in a complex problem is that when you're 
when you find an optimal point, uh, you may be at a local optimum point instead of at the global optimum point. And figuring out where you are is more of an art than a science. So when you're going back and uh, learning all these weights, uh, right now you can't let these things run blindly. So you do need an, an expert who understands this part of this technology to kind of help you figure out uh, are you close to an optimum that you will trust to deploy. So I, I, I don't think these things are hands off at the present state. And then there's going to be another question. Oh, good question. Um, in adjusting the weights for an artificial neural network, isn't there a danger of, of curve fitting, which I'm going to take to mean overfitting? Uh, so there's a danger in all of these modeling techniques of overfitting. Uh, most likely you know about uh, validation and cross-validation. So it's absolutely required uh, to validate or cross-validate all of these models. Uh, once you get them into production, it's very important that you monitor them uh, because if you've overfit, the production results will be nothing like uh, the training results in your lab, and you want to find this out right away. Uh, so deploying these models is still labor-intensive. That's one of the new skills that organizations need to develop. Uh, more questions? Oh, this is great. You guys are great with questions. Or I'll uh, ask that one seven. Uh -huh. It seems that some tools are still in the domain of specialized individuals like R or Python experts. Uh, when do you see machine learning become as simple and easy to use as an Excel formula? That could happen uh, maybe in the next decade or so. Uh, what will happen is the techniques I talked about today will all become kind of off the shelf uh, in the next five years or ten years for sure. And then they'll be packaged up in toolkits that everybody can use. So, uh, so you know uh, probably how to use the R toolkit. There are different cool toolkits like the Stata toolkit and, uh, and other kind of kind of more like spreadsheet toolkits. Uh, Microsoft um, is struggling, but uh, they have a huge installed base, and they'll port as much as they can into uh, a future version of Excel, uh, which will probably still be called Excel, even if it's completely different. Uh, so we have time for one more question, I'm told, and it's being passed to me now. How long and how do you think the leading businesses will develop machine learning capabilities, especially when they're uh, struggling with normal predictive applications? So let's go back to uh, the framework from RE. Uh, it's over here someplace. Here it is. So, so RE's framework is really good. So you look at all of these steps that you have to do, and only the third step uh, needs the machine learning expert. All of these other steps need people who understand the business and understand a business strategy. So I think this is a first, it's, an, it's a situation where there are first mover advantages. So if you can move early uh, in a company, uh, then you can get the benefits of the new, uh, the better decisions yourself. Uh, so the companies that have the insight to do this, this is not necessarily the biggest companies because you know, to do the third step where you need these machine learning experts, um, you only need a few of them. It's not that you need to hire 500 people. You need to hire, you know, three to ten people to get started. Uh, so uh, companies with the insight can move early on this. Uh, there'll be a huge uh, number of people who are slow followers. Uh, they don't believe it's going to make a difference to them. They couldn't figure out how, how to hire three to ten people. They figured that even if they could hire three to ten people doing the other four steps, it's just too hard for them to execute. They're basically harvesting their businesses, and they'll be in a position where they'll have to stop the bleeding, uh, but, uh, so that their benefits will be uh, fewer losses, uh, but it's a first mover game. You see a lot of startups in this area, the people who are reinventing uh, businesses by carving out a piece that can be uh, mostly fully automated. So, so thank you uh, very much. I uh, super appreciate the questions. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Lawrence, for um, you know such an insightful webinar and really helpful for our MSBA students and alumni and also just the greater community. Um, this slide deck will be available and the webinar has been recorded for all of you who are interested and we will be sending out a brief survey shortly after and we really appreciate your attendance and this is the conclusion of the webinar. Thank you so much and thank you to Dr. Lawrence.